Well, I think you can all agree that that's much better than me doing those announcements. Um, so, <laughs> so, good evening and welcome to tonight's BTS evening meeting. So, tonight um, we have the Harding Prize competition, which for those of you who are not aware, is named in honour of Sir Harold Harding, the founding chairman of the BTS, and it is for papers on aspects of tunnelling considered of interest to the industry. And I can't say how great it is enough to see so many people here in attendance tonight. So, tonight we have two papers, um, as unfortunately one of our entrants has had to withdraw this afternoon, um, and our two finalists are on the stage here. So we have a paper by Christopher Barrett from Bam Nuttall on the planning on, and construction of Mainline Tunnel B Connection Tunnel, and also Mark from the University of Cambridge on a numerical approach to estimate the rock pillar strength. And tonight, our judging panel is Alistair Fraser, Mike King, and Alistair Smith, um, who will be um, taking notes during the meeting. And then at the end, we'll have a short period where they withdraw um, and come back and give us the, the announcement of tonight's winner. So, without any further ado, and just a big wish of good luck to both of you from me, um, if we could have our first applicant. So, let's take the stage. Thank you very much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Christopher Barrett. First, I'd like to thank the BTS for the opportunity to, um, to be here tonight. Um, I'll be presenting the planning and construction of Mainline Tunnel B at the Thames Tideway West Tunnel um, Project. So starting off with the agenda, um, I'll briefly give an introduction um, about myself, the project, and a, a short sequence of works for the actual MNTLB. And then I'll touch on the, the three main challenges we had in the planning and construction of the tunnel, followed by the conclusion. So um, I've worked for Ban Nuttall for 13 years now, starting off as an apprentice engineer working at Tottenham Court Road Station Upgrade. I then moved on to Farringdon Station, working on the SCL works on the platform tunnels and the um, lower concourses and the escalator barrels. I then moved on to Thames Tideway West Tunnel, where I, worked, I looked after the main, um, the SCL shaft, sorry, at the main drive site, Carmouth Road. Then moved on to the TBM works for an hour, uh, for, sorry, not an hour, for a year. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, then following that, I was given the opportunity to um, plan and manage the mainline Tunnel B connection tunnel. I'm currently working at um, Silvertown Tunnel, managing the cross passage works. Um, so, brief overview of the project itself. The Thames Sideway Tunnel is 25 kilometres in length. It's got 34 overflow points and it's broken up into three different sections, the west, the central and the east. Um, initially, the original scope of works was for the central TBM to bore through to Karma Road, where it would be removed. Um, unfortunately, due to a uh, conflict of the programs, the client deemed the most efficient way forward was to turn and bury the TBM, as you can see from the, from the green outline there. Um, and then B&B &B were instructed to construct a mainline tunnel B connection tunnel, which is outlined in red over here. That was bored, or that was um, driven from the Karma Road site, uh, kind of a shaft into the um, existing segmental tunnel. So a few details on the MNTLB connection tunnel. Uh, we use spray concrete lining as a construction method. It's 92 metres of SCL. It's a 7.9 metre internal diameter, the SCL section is. And then the excavation material we went through was a combination of clay, segmental lining and backfill grout. And the connection detail with the segmental section was an SCL collar wrapped around the first permanent ring of Flows Tunnel, or Central Sections Tunnel. Um, moving on to the high level construction sequence. So the first stage was for Flow to backfill a section of their segmental tunnel, as you can see up here. And then over at Carnworth Road, the B&B &B team, we constructed or we thickened the existing reception chamber. So we took it from a 9.5 metre diameter down to a 7.9 metre diameter tunnel. And then we constructed the pilot tunnel, followed by the enlargement and you can see over there on the the east side the collar around the segmental section which i'll go into more detail on in further slides um so the first challenge that we had was the um 
preparation works for and TLB. So we had to install a number of wells on the surface at Karma Road. As you can see from the, the plan behind me here, or the aerial view, is quite a congested site, even with the original scope, just to drive the TBM and carry out the mainline tunnel A secondary line works. On the left-hand side, you've got the acoustic shed. It's 90 metres in length by 30 metres in width. It's got a 28 metre diameter shaft inside it, so we only had two thirds of the space to work in. And then on the north side, you can see the only access and egress into the job. So that was a lifeline into the job. We couldn't, we couldn't block that at all. And then on the right hand side, you've got the external mud bin. So that managed the spoil from the TBM. It went into the mud bin and then transferred into the barges. So we had to install seven number wells on the surface. As you can see from the, the area view there, they're right in the middle of the job. We had to ensure that they were navigated around the existing segmental tunnel, which is highlighted in green on the right hand side there, and also around the not yet constructed MNTLB connection tunnel. So the key here for me was to ensure that I brought the designer, the subcontractor, and our surface team at Karma Road together from the very beginning, so that the, the, the surface team understood what we were doing, how we were going to do it, and how we'd not um, block the whole road going into the TBM drive itself, because the key here was to ensure the TBM production wasn't affected in the slightest. So in order to do that, each set of well points we installed, we managed to maintain the whole road by either diverting it or keeping it in the same place. In some instances where we couldn't do that, I engaged with the surface team at Karma Road early to ensure they had all the materials and the equipment inside the shed in preparation for us blocking the whole road. So overall, that worked out very well, albeit the site being as congested as it was. Um, moving from outside the shed to, to inside the shed, so as you can see from the plan here, this is the original layout for the acoustic sheds when the MNTLA secondary line of works were taking place from Karma Road to Acton. You can see there on the north side, northeast side, you've got the secondary line of batching plant. And then around on the west side, you've got enough room to restore materials and equipment. And then on the south side of the shed, you've got the internal sand and aggregate bin. So the whole idea there was to ensure that they had enough material inside the shed to keep the secondary line of works going when the shed doors were closed outside of 6 and 61 hours, which was 66% of the time. Um, so that was the original scope. And this is what we ended up with um, based on the new scope of works with the MNTLB connection tunnel. Um, on the southeast side, I organised the installation of the batching plant. So we tried to keep the batching plant, the SCL batching plant, as tight to the southeast corner of the shed as we possibly could. So we installed all the admixture tanks in between the plimps or the, the columns inside the shed, placed them on plimps so that we could run the shock creep lines underneath them along the south side of the shed, along here, so they're out of the way. We also installed um, a diverter chute on the batching plant, which I'll go into more detail on in the next few slides. And then as you move along the shed to the, the west, you can see um, the internal mud bin. So the idea here was to run a conveyor system into that internal mud bin. I wanted to make sure that we could run the, the, the MNTLB SCL works 24-7. So we installed a small conveyor running from the internal mud bin out along the river wall to the external mud bin. Um, I then had the de-dusters placed up on the surface of the shed rather than at the pit bottom. Um, the idea here was to keep as much room at the pit bottom as we only had a third of the shaft to work inside for the MNTLB works. Um, and as you move around to the north side, the internal standard aggregate bins um, were installed on the north side there. They were to keep the supply of shock creek going to the, the SCL batching plant throughout the works. Obviously, like I said before, where the doors were closed outside section 61 hours, we had to ensure we had a, a decent supply of shock creek coming from the batching plant to the SCL tunnel. Um, and then the second July and batching plant remained in the same place, but with a conveyor system running from outside to inside to serve as the hoppers for the aggregates and the sands. All in all, that worked very well, but just to give you a better idea, or more of an idea of how it actually looked inside there, I've got a few pictures. So on the left-hand side there, you can see how the shaft looked from the top looking down. You've got the, the lower level, which is the MNTLB side. You can see the muck bin there that we installed at the bottom. So the idea of that muck bin is obviously to ensure that we've got enough room down there to store the material whilst doing the excavation works. Because we had only one crane operating over the three interfaces, I didn't want to rely solely on the one crane to get the muck out. 
I made sure there was enough room at the pit bottom that we could muck a number of advances if the crane was unavailable to us. Um, and then obviously you've got on the, the higher levels there, you've got the MNTLA secondary lining deck and then further up over here you've got the Frogmore drive. So like I said, three at the faces, one hook. It was quite a lot of work and quite a lot of organisation to keep things moving. Um, if you look down towards the bottom of the side, you've got a picture of inside the shed. So you know, as you can see from the, from the plan, it all looks really good. It looks like you've got loads of room inside there for the haul roads, but as many of you probably know, when you come to install batching plants and site set up, you add on small bits and pieces here and there, the haul road became a lot more narrower. The key here was to ensure that we had a haul road going right the way through and we could maintain access to the shaft and to the shed itself, which worked out really well. Um, going back to the batching plants, I mentioned earlier, we had the diverter chute installed on the batching plant. Um, previously, when we did the SCL works at Carnworth Roads, we were constructing the SCL shaft, we had the whole shed to ourselves. So we could install a, a mobile, we could use a mobile remixer to drive the shock creep from the batcher over to the pump. If we had any rejected loads, we could just discharge them straight into the remixer, tip it up into the bin, and then we could go again. In this instance, we didn't have that luxury anymore because we had no room inside the shed. Therefore, we installed a static remixer underneath the batching plant. Um, the disadvantage of having that is if you have any bad loads, then you've got bad shock creep inside the remixer. You've then got to clean it out before you can go again. So I worked closely with the, um, the shock creep supplier to install a diverter chute on the batching plant. This enabled us to take samples of the shock creep before it came out of the mixing pan whereby if it was low on the flow side, we could add water to it and then we could put it into the remixer and use it, bring it back into spec. If it was on the high side, we had an opportunity to, to dump the loads using the diverter chute away from the remixer itself and into a waste skip adjacent to the remixer. So um, we made the best that we could out of it and all in all, with the water addition procedure, we had about 95% of shockery accepted once we got through the teething issues of the commissioning work. So it worked out really well with the diverter chute overall. Um, moving on to the construction works. So um, the reception chamber was the first section of works yet to complete. So um, it was a thickening. We had four number layers um, working in by to out by. We completed one layer, then went back in and completed the second layer, so on and so forth. We had 59 advances in total. Um, at the beginning, we had a few issues in terms of fallouts. We had seven fallouts in total in the first 22 advances. Um, after each fallout, we took an action. We, 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 we organised to ensure that we checked what the issue was. We went through every action you could. We checked the accelerator, changed the accelerator. We recalibrated the pumps, recalibrated the shock creep pumps, um, made sure the, the, the lining was being jet washed before we sprayed, ensure that the advanced lengths weren't, weren't, the advanced lengths weren't too long. Um, but after the seventh fallout, we'd have a, a, a consecutive few at that time, I, I decided that the best way forward, or the best way was to stop. So in terms of health and safety, that was the best thing to do, and in terms of the, moral, the morale of the men, that was the best thing to do, because if you're an Osmarin, then the shock reach constantly falling out. It's, it's not good for your confidence, it's not good for your morale. So I organised meetings um, between ourselves, myself, the um, subcontractor, the client, the designer. We Batted around the ideas of what the issue could be, and ultimately we came down to the, the, the idea that it might be an uh, ambient temperature issue inside the shed. So around January time, the shed ambient temperature dropped below minus one degrees. Some of the admixtures, when they went below that temperature, needed to be agitated to come back into, into life. Unfortunately, the, um, the supplier didn't have an agitator inside the tank uh, for, the, for the admixtures, therefore they were no use. I instructed them to bring in some new admixtures. We carried out a number of, we sprayed a number of panels, panels, sorry. We sprayed panels with hot air, with cold air, with old accelerator, with new accelerator, with the old admixtures and with the new admixtures. Um, the, the one difference being, the one, the one constant being, was that each panel with the new admixtures, the early age strengths were fine, there was no issues. So we decided that was a problem. We took out the old admixtures, we put the new ones in, and then we recommenced the works. We did ask the, the supplier though to ensure they had an agitator inside their tanks and that they had hot, hot blankets around the tank or insulation around the tanks to ensure the temperatures didn't drop back down again. Moving on from there, we then recommenced spraying and we only had one fallout in 36 advances. So we went from a 30% fallout ratio 
to a 25% fall up, or 2.5% fall up ratio, sorry. So, um, worked out really well. Stopping the job, stopping the production actually helped us long term because it regained the confidence of the men and they could continue with the works. Uh, moving on to the final challenge that we had. So, this is the flare connection detail. So this, um, this is the SCL collar around the segmental lining. You've got four number re-injectable hoses there, and it is about um, five, 750 in width by 500 in depth. The original construction sequence for this flare section was using the excavator and using the spray robot. So the idea was to use the excavator to muck around the ring, as you can see up here, and then we'd move in the spray robot to spray the layers. So there's seven layers in total, one to seven. Um, in terms of this construction sequence from, from the beginning, I thought there might be a better way of doing this to reduce the risk. My, my, my big issue was that using a 35 ton excavator to muck around a permanent ring, there's a lot of risk involved in terms of potentially damaging the ring, cracking it, major spalling, and then that would have led on to major remedial works whereby the, the incentive for production would have been uh, null and void because we had to do loads of remedial work to get it fixed. And then similar with the robot, um, my issue with using the robot was that potentially for the first two layers we would end up with a lot of rebound inside there, a lot of hollows inside there, poor encapsulation around the Fuco hoses, or sorry, the re injectable hoses. And um, so I thought that there might be a better way. We started to progress plans, or I started to progress plans going forward to look at other methods of um, the excavation and the spraying. So firstly, um, as you can see there, this is the seven layers we had to spray for the flare connection. Um, the first, or the, the, the last five layers, three to seven, I didn't have a big issue with those. They could be sprayed with the robot, no big problem. But layers one and two, I thought, were high risk using the robot. So working closely with um, the designer and working closely with um, Folkswork and Formwork specialists, we instructed them to um, uh, give us a design for uh, a cordex section that was replicating the in situ flare. So what we did with this, I had the guys build this on the surface at Carnworth Road. We had a 1.8 meter long one and a 3.6 meter long. So the 1.8 was the worst case scenario and the 3.6 was the best case scenario. Um, the idea in my mind was to carry out a wet trial using a robot, but then after offering up the robot to the actual cordex, um, False work, or the the the, the um, I forgot the words now. But after offering it up to this, we realised that that wasn't the way to go. We had the Nozman get got their feedback. They realised they, they mentioned that the visualisation the visualisation was very poor. They couldn't see what they were doing, and that was on a surface that was level, and they should be able to see in there no problem. So it would have been a lot worse in situ. And then in terms of the baggings and the boom, they would have been rubbing up against the extra loss of the lining. So. In this situation, it's not too bad because it's just cordic, but down there, it's SCL, it would have been ripping the baggings, it would have caused a lot of damage to the robot. So I decided the best way forward was to change the spraying technique and go with the more traditional method of um, hand spraying. So I got the guys to spray layers one and two. Um, they had no problems, they were happy, it worked well, they had good control, good visualization. And after the spray, on the right hand side there, you can see the final product. So we struck it, you can see inside there we had good encapsulation around the re-injectable hoses, no real rebound, good compaction, so it was a, it was a no-brainer really. The best way forward was to, to hand spray the, um, the layers one and two of the flare connection. Um, then moving on to the excavation sequence. So like I said before, I thought there was high risk with um, excavating around the permanent ring using the 35 tonner. So I decided the best way forward working with the designer was to excavate it by hand in stages. So working from the top, you put your, your excavate the top section, which was um, a, a, a out of E, for instance, so five stages, A through to E, and then seal it, and then go down for the second section, and then repeat the process all the way down to the bottom. Um, that worked really well. We had no major issues with the, um, with the inspection. So we had the designer down there, we had the, the client down there, they looked into it, they checked the ring, no major problems. The guys had the opportunity when they were excavating around the ring to give it a good clean off, give it a good jet wash. Thorough inspections took place, so all the parties were happy. And then the final product, or nearly the final product, this is post completion of layers one, two, and three to five. So as you can see right the way around there, the circumferential joint of the segmental lining is in sound condition. 
no problems at all. Whereas if we were using the excavator, that would have probably looked a lot different. Um, moving on to the conclusion, um, I've worked at Tideway for I worked at Tideway for five and a half years. It's been uh, the, an amazing adventure. Um, as you can see from this collage of pictures here, it runs through each section of works or each phase of works. Um, and in terms of I should start moving now. Yes, perfect. Um, in terms of the MNTLB connection tunnel, it's, it was a fantastic opportunity. We had a lot of hurdles to jump. The, the, the site wasn't made for this kind of works, but we made it work. And I worked closely with the designer, worked closely with the, um, the client, with the subcontractors. And the best way forward was to take those guys for the ride along with us. And in all honesty, the SCL drive worked very well at Carnegie Road. And I'm very proud of what we've done there. And a big thanks to the BNB team for all their help. And support. Uh, thank you very much. Looking to the three of you. Do you want to do questions now, or do you want to do them at the end? It's up to you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so we'll just have a, a period of time to take some questions, firstly from the three judges, and then we'll take them from the floor. Yeah. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. That was a, that was a great presentation. Uh, just one question about the grout infill in the segmental lining. Did you have a, did you think about putting a, a joint in the grout to make the, the breakout easier? There was, we didn't think about putting a joint in the grout because the grout was um, relatively weak strength, so we had no issue with removing it, using the road header on the chafe and the road header on the 924 in terms of production times didn't slow us down in the slide. So um, I think if the, if the grout was stronger, then yes, it would have been thought about by the central section, but with the, the strength of the grout, we had no issues going through it. Yeah, yeah Chris, um, great presentation. Um, how did you offset the, the health and safety issues with handworks versus remote operation? So in terms of the handworks, we tried to keep the guys, well, in all honesty, the, um, in terms of halves, there was no major issue because it was such a short duration. We were digging through clay. We had a number of operators down there that they could change over within the limit times. Um, in terms of staying underneath the solid shotcrete and not going underneath the clay, um, the depth for the excavation being only 500 deep, they didn't. They never needed to go actually to actually go underneath the clay itself. They're always always underneath the shotcrete, so they had a safe haven in that. So. There were the two main mitigations that we took, and like I say, the actual excavation itself was so short, there was no major problems. Uh, thanks again for the presentation. At the beginning, you mentioned you're now at uh, Silvertown looking after the cross passages. What are the main things you've taken from your experiences? Um, to be honest, I think, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, working on the shaft at um, Tideway was a big learning experience as well because it, it, it brought me. Um, on a few phases in terms of you need to bring as many of the parties along for the, the ride as you can. So for instance, with MNTLB, from the get-go, it was an open playing field in terms of you had the designer there, you had the client there, you had the subcontractors brought into it, and where you're bringing everyone along for the, the actual planning phase of it, they understand what you're doing. Um, and that's a, that's a big thing. I think people over, they miss that sometimes. They tend to get into tunnel vision almost and say, right, well, I'm planning this, that's the way it's going. If you bring the designer in early, you bring the subcontractors in early, everyone's got an idea of what's going on. You can work collaboratively and it works very well. Um, also, site setup is key. You know, it's, it's not just about what you're doing down there, it's about what's going up on the, on the surface. If you've got a good setup on the surface, that's the beginning, that's where things start from. So if that's going well, down below is going well. So in my mind, they're two of the key things that I've learned from MTLB. And the other thing I've learned actually is the morale of the men. So if you've got a decent relationship with the guys down there, they'll do what they need to do for you and they'll get the work done for you and they'll push the extra bit. So I could go on forever, really, in terms of what I've learned from it. But. Thanks. So any more questions from the judges? Oh, there's one more. <laughs> yeah, one last one. Chris, uh, if you had to do it again, what would you do differently? Oh. <laughs> um, well, to be honest, in terms of the SCL, 
Um, the way you worked, I think the SEL worked really well, to be honest. But if I, I didn't present it, but the secondary lining is taking place at the moment. And in all honesty, with the secondary lining, if I could do the secondary lining again, I would move away from a full round shutter because obviously we've got a, we've got a drain essentially. That's what we've got. There's a pipe, and you need to follow a certain fall. I would I would move towards using an invert shutter right the way through. You get a nice decent level that's that's sorted, and then the secondary lining crown shutter comes through and it follows that line. Whereas with a full round shutter, if you're not pouring at the at the right rate or the concrete's too wet, you end up with uplift and you've got problems. So. Um, SCL wise, uh, to be honest, I, I, I thought it worked really well, but secondary line inside, I've got a few lessons learned from that that I take into the cross pastures at Silverton. Okay. There's no more from the judges. We'll open to the floor. What was the total duration for the shock group? Oh, God. Sorry. Um, say that again. What was the total duration? Total duration for the shock group. So we started the um, reception chamber thickening in. February or January, sorry, 2021, and then we finished the SCL in June 21. Five months. Left. Five months, and that was obviously working with two other interfaces at the same time, having only one gantry crane working, serving three interfaces, and essentially not being the critical path. So um, it went relatively well. I know it seems like a long time, but considering everything that was going on in the site and the fact that we had to reset the site for the MNTLB construction, it went relatively smoothly. Okay, any other questions? Okay, what we'll do is we may come to questions at the, at the very end as well, if someone thinks of something else. Okay, so in which case, um, if the judges are okay, we'll move on to the next, um, the next entrance. So if Mark, say so. <laughs> Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Um, this is Mark from University of Cambridge. So my presentation is going to be about a numerical model in estimating the rock pillar strength, and in particular, it will be for the rock pillar during the tunnel construction, and how this model com perform comparing with the conventional empirical estimation. So I will briefly give some basic concept about the rock pillar and why we need it. I will then go on to introduce some conventional previous empirical approaches in solving this problem. Then I will be a bit more detailed in introduce my, the procedure of my constructing the numerical model following a comparison between the numerical and the empirical result with a summary and some of my idea about the future study. So the pillar in tunnel has been described as a piece of in-situ rock mass between two underground openings. It can be either temporary or permanent, depends on the function in the project. And this study is in particular focused on the pillar temporary spot during the tunnel construction. The main purpose to using this geometry in construction sequence is to improve the heading frequency by saving the time for the following internal work, such as installing the rock bolt, matching with the reinforcement, or spraying the shock grid. Because with this kind of um, rock boundary, two or multiple different construction crew can work simultaneously without affecting each other. So the plot on the left shows an example of the two header construction sequence with this um, temporary um, rock pillar in the middle. Compared with the conventional one head, the lead plus trail construction sequence on the right, the lead head is always in front of the trail head. So when the road header is actually cutting the trail head, the construction crew need to wait until the road header finish cutting in order to do any work in front of the lead head, which obviously caused more delay in the schedule. So we can imagine that um, this narrow rock mass in the tunnel is highly risky because it's hiding isolate in both two adjacent sidewalls. And unfortunately, the first trial on estimating the strength on the rock pillar actually started after the 1960 
the coal broke disaster in South Africa, which is probably one of the worst mining disasters in the history. Simon and Moro in 1967 come up with this um, empirical formula by stating that the payload strength sigma p in this case is relating to the payload geometry, especially width over the height, as well as the integral strength. So based on this primary principle, there are numerous empirical formulas being created from different geological material. The concept here looks really similar. The only thing different with those formula is the empirical judgment about the local geological features. But how, so mathematically, the payload is getting more stable if it gets a wider and shorter geometry. However, it should be noticed that the rock mass as a whole material is really complicated. Instead of the integral strength, factors such as the geological structures, the boundary condition, or even the moisture condition can cause certain influence on the rock behavior. And we can all imagine that this is really hard to quantify those factors into several empirical coefficients. Other limitations include, such as the difference in the pillar boundary conditions. So for the mining pillar, just like the one showing on the left, it normally has been fully flexible in all four different sidewalls. So in this case, the pillar is actually support the entire tunnel, just like a column in the building. However, in the case of the tunnel construction, the backside of the pillar has always been connected with the in-situ rock, which is not exactly the same case. And also we can realize all these empirical formula are actually divided, um, created from the back analysis based on the existing failure. But ideally, we would like to predict the payload stability in a really early preliminary stage because we want the failure never to happen. And finally, just as mentioned before, um, different geological material will give different empirical judgment. And therefore, um, it is really hard to, it's really hard to using this um, empirical formula to apply to a completely different geological structures. So in this case, I think um, the numerical modeling, especially the 3D numerical modeling, is an alternative solution to undertake this job. The software using here is um, Itasca 3 deck It's a commercial code mainly working with the disk and units material. And now, in practical, it's really hard to change the height of the pillar because the tunnel geometry normally been decided before creating the construction sequence. And therefore, all the model in this series has the exactly same pillar height. And the width over the height ratio is only going to change with different pillar widths. The geological structure here, including three horizontal bedding parting, they are equally spaced, clean, no infill, with normal roughness. So you can see here the geological structure has been simplified in order to avoid any kind of potential wedge formation. So in terms of the geological material, the rock material we consider here is the semi hawkesbury sandstone. It's the most common geological material we have in Sydney Basin at Australia. So just some briefly instruction about its engineering property. For the class one, class two rock mass, GSI roughly around 75 to 85, depends on the scale of the rock. Defect spacing normally greater than 600 mil. The UCS in this case is roughly around 25 to 30 megapascal. And the picture on the left shows an example with highly weathered condition. And the one on the top is actually a core box obtained from the borehole just beside this rock mass. In terms of the constitutive model we have, um, the model we're using here is the generalized hook brown failure criterion, which is probably one of the most well-known rock material based on the GSI system. And I think this is an improved version with this actual A parameter outside of the bracket, which is normally equal to 0 0.5 as a constant before. And now this A parameter is also a variable, depends on the rock GSI. Rock behavior. So, as we all know, rock is a really highly brittle material. So I think it makes sense to have a really big decrease 
of the strength after it's reaching yielding. And therefore, the rock behavior we consider here is the elastic, brittle plastic material um, behavior, which means after the yielding, there's a really big drawdown of the stress. In order to achieve this behavior, I have recalculated all the hook brown parameters with a much smaller GSI in the residual stage. The GSI is equal to 80 in the pre-yielding phase, and it's going to drop to 30 in the post-yielding phase. And you can see how significant the hook brown M and S parameter change with this smaller GSI. The A parameter doesn't really change that much in this case, because even though A become a variable, it's still a constant 0 0.5 plus some kind of variable with the GSI, which doesn't really matter in this case, and is roughly equal to 0 0.5 in all the phase. Boundary condition here is quite similar with a standard raw unconfined compression test. The bottom is fixed, and we have load being continually increased on the top of the pillar. The key feature here is how to consider the boundary condition around the backward of the pillar. So I have made in two different scenarios here. In case A, I have made in the entire pillar of the backside wall be fully flexible. So in this case, the pillar has a similar boundary condition, just like the mine pillar from the empirical method. And all we have case B, which is getting fixed in the hiding direction. So in this case, the, pillar, the entire model is sort of in like a plant string environment, which I believe it's more realistic for the tunnel construction. So as the result, here is the stress, vertical stress over the lateral displacement recording from one group of the comparison. They are the exactly the same pillar geometry. Heading length is four meter, with over height ratio 0 0.5. Pillar height is all eight meter. So in this case, the cross section of the pillar is a square. We can see the pillar strength is actually dropped immediately after it's reaching the yielding, which is exactly what we predicted before. With the exactly same pillar dimension, we can see the pillar in case B got roughly around 20% more higher of the yielding strength compared with case A, which means the pillar is getting more stable if it has some connection with the backside of the institute rock. And this is uh, the summary of all the modeling outputs I made. So the vertical axis in this case is the pillar union stress over the rock UCS, and horizontal axis is the pillar width over the height ratio. And we can see that with different heading lines, the previous statement is still reliable that the pillar in case B get roughly 20 to 25% more higher of the union strength. In particular for the case B, in terms of the tunnel construction, we can see that the Taylor yielding strength doesn't really change that much with different heading lines for the width over high ratio from 0 0.5 to 1.0. And this is really important because in, the re in practical, it is really uncommon to have a two wide pillar that has the width over height ratio greater than 1.0. And in comparison, I have compared all the numerical outputs with two major empirical methods I have found before. So in this case, we can see that the empirical estimation has overestimated the pillar strength in all the dimensions, which I believe this is because the analyzed rock mass from those two empirical formula has a much higher rock use as compared with the Sydney sandstone. And in particular, I think the Lander and the Parkinson's formula, which is one, the lower one, it's more advanced because in this case, it's got, it's at least it got some similarly some similar stress increment compared with the numerical outputs, where the previous estimation become not that reliable when the pillar is getting wider. So in summary, the numerical models give a more conservative estimation. I wouldn't use the term accurate because there's no comparison with any field measurement. And we can see how significant the boundary condition, especially the sidewall boundary condition, can make in terms of estimating the pillar rock strength. And obviously, all the empirical formulas need to be carefully reviewed based on its original background before applying to any real projects. And we also can avoid the importance of the geological structure in affecting the pillar stability. 
Even just a slightly sub-vertical joint can cause some potential wedge formations, and it will just completely change the mechanism. And in the end, just some of my idea about the future study of this model. So obviously, more geological structure will be considered, more realistic simulation we get, and obviously more time consuming the model will be. We still not quite understand the how the mechanism works between the connection between the pillar and the rock. So the backward boundary condition need to be further studied. And as mentioned before, the modeling data are only going to be applicable if there are some kind of comparison with the physical modeling or the field measurement. And in the end, there's a judgment about whether to model the material as continuous or discontinuous, as well as the mathematical iteration in different numerical code work slightly different. So the selection of the numerical modeling also plays a really significant rules in terms of estimating the final result. And that's all I have got today. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take any question. Open to the judges first. Uh, Mark, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Um, in terms of application to kind of uh, tunnel projects, is there is there a, a program to do some field field work to justify the modelling against the empirical? Um, actually, this is um, numerical modelling that is based on a real project in Australia, but due to the confidential issue, I can't really name in the project. And we do have the field management. But because I'm currently um, already resigned from the Paris firm, so we're not allowed to use any really field data to do any kind of modeling. But yeah, there is a real project that's doing with exactly the same condition we can see before. And then the follow-up question on that. Yeah. How, how was the correlation between the numerical modeling and the, the field data? Well, this is a really interesting thing. It's like, just as we saw from the future study, ideally, more factors we consider in the numerical modeling, we should get a more realistic data. However, since all the numerical modeling is constructed artificially, so we don't really know how important in terms of different factors to infect this kind of um, result. So sometimes, the simplified model with a simplified geometry actually works better in terms of the correlation with the field measurement, but it's a there's a judgment regarding that. So this simplified model actually works very well in terms of the correlation compared with we do have a really complicated model with all the defect recording from the real data, and it doesn't really simulate that well compared with the simplified one. Well, Alistair's lost my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks very much, Mark. It's very comprehensively covered. Um, can I just ask about discontinuities? Uh, I don't think you've done the work yet, but what sort of impact do you think discontinuity is going to have on the, the results that you've got? It's obvious from what you've done that we, we can't trust the empirical formula anymore. Yeah. What, how much um, worse are things going to get when we start modeling discontinuities in the... In your, in your model. I think it depends on in different, in practical, in different kind of a case, because we all know that rock at itself is not really a continuous material. The reason why we're modeling that as a continuous or discontinuous is that we want the computer to have a first trial in any iteration to tell him like where to actually start it. But in terms of the selection of the numerical modeling, I think from my first understanding, this discontinuous modeling works better compared with the continuous modeling in rock mechanic only. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Mark. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, in terms of the pillar width to height ratios you looked at, the lowest one you went down to was 0 0.5. Yeah. Is that based on a, a rule of thumb, or why did you stop it? Um, it just, so 
the entire modeling is actually starting with based on all the summary of the empirical method. The reason for starting with a 0 0.5 is because 0 0.5 is actually the starting from the empirical method. That's the first time they started. So we're trying to be consistent with the modeling geometry they have as well. Okay. Do you, if you, do you think you see similar results in terms of your case B having close matching if you go lower than that? Point? Well, I think like in practical, it's not that um, common even to have a too narrow pillar as well. Okay. It should always be like a really suitable case. Thank you. Okay, if no more from the judges, then we'll open to the floor. Yeah. And if you just give your name and affiliation. Hi, Mark. Yeah. I'm Christopher Ebele from Mark McDonald. Uh, thanks for your presentation. Maybe I didn't spot it, but what was the failure, failure criterion which was actually, where did you stop your, your, your uh, iteration? Of course, clearly you had a um, well, uh, a strain softening material. Well, as, yeah, so as you see from the recording, the loading applied on the top of the failure is actually continuous, it's, not, it's never stopped. The way how we apply the increasing induced load is to apply a displacement on the top of the pillar. So in this case, um, theoretically, you will never see the pillar getting failed in this case because of the geological structure we consider is only the three horizontal binding parting. So the paler itself will never going to come out of the, its original geometry. The reason why we stop is because, um, as you see from the result, the lateral displacement only been going out for like around five millimeter, I think. Yeah. So you, you basically, you, you install the deformation quite yeah. as a cutoff. Yeah, exactly. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Oh. Ah, there's one. Sorry, the yeah. lights. <laughs> so, uh, when considering construction method, excavation method for the formula that you apply, uh, let's say mechanical breaking or drill and blast, what was the effect on the coefficients that you used? Sorry, um, can you repeat again? The in terms of the excavation method used. Yeah. While comparing the sensitivity analysis, what was considered and what was the effect on the coefficients that were used and what would be the effect on the strength of the pillar that was investigated? Well, this is depends on like, um, as you said, like the way how you excavating the rock, whether you're using blasting or you're doing digging with the road header. The reason, the things we saw from the computer is a really ideal case, like, um, it's a numerical modeling, so we know it's perfect. We know everything about that. But in reality, from the real construction, even though we think the pillar looks exactly similar than the one that we have in the modeling, it always has some uncertainty due to different kind of construction sequence, the way how you construct it, or even the people who actually operate the machine, it's all going to change the difference in terms of the pillar behavior. Sorry, it's an answer to the question. Okay, any more questions? Okay, well just as I said I'd do earlier, just open up to any questions for either of the candidates tonight. Okay, we've got one. Yeah, John Corcoran from Morgan said, look, one for Chris, that tricky wrap around you did at the end, did you consider hand excavation and timber, and then pick it up with the shutter as you came back? Um, not in particular um, at the time, John, because um, the method that we had with the SCL works, the risk in terms of the encapsulation and, and, and the rebound and the rest, but we had, we had, we had, I had no major cause of concern based on the trials that we carried out. If there was a concern based on the trial that we carried out, then it would have been a consideration to look down other avenues, and that probably would have been one to go down. Okay. Any more from the room? Okay. At that point, then, um, we'll draw questions to a close and allow our three judges to adjourn to make their decision. Um, and if during that time, um, I think we'll give you maximum about five to no ten minutes. <laughs> um, but if I could ask, um, feel feel free to talk amongst amongst yourselves. Um, 
whilst we wait with bated breath. Well done, Mark. Well done. Well done, mate. Yeah, great job. That's it, that's it. I don't really care about the result. Very different presentations. This is very complicated. It's completely Mark. different. Mark.
Okay. So the judges have returned, and you're going to have to bear with me because I've got Mr. King's handwriting. Um, so the judges were very impressed with the quality of the papers and the presentation. They thought both of these media, the candidates have demonstrated an in-depth knowledge of their subject areas and an understanding of the potential uses involved and issues involved. The final decision was a very close call, but overall, the judges consider that the winner of this year's Harding Prize is Christopher Barrett. So, very many congratulations, Christopher. Thanks a lot. So, you are now um, the proud winner of two tickets for the BTS dinner, um, which hopefully um, accept and able to come along. Yep. Um, you also receive a copy of Sir Harold Harding's book, which is Tunnelling History and My Own Involvement, a certificate and a cheque for £500, uh, which hopefully is an encouragement for many others to enter in the future as well. But you also end up in the Hall of Fame, along with a number of other prestigious people that have entered and have been successful for the Harding Prize. Um, but really want to make a big thanks to everybody that has taken part and submitted papers. Um, it's always fascinating each year seeing what we get through and also just hearing about what people are up to in this industry. So thank you very much to all who have taken part. And congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you. So, I now have a couple of announcements tonight, which are hopefully going to, yep, going to seamlessly link through. So, the first one is, unfortunately, or fortunately, some may say, we are still at our temporary home. Um, the BTS bar, we've been promised sort of September. Hopefully, we'll be back downstairs. But for tonight, um, we are downstairs, maybe upstairs, at the Westminster Arms. Next slide, which for those of you who don't know, it's just round the corner. And if you don't know where it is, um, follow someone that does. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so the man that's just spoken there has yeah. very kindly um, has got the drinks tonight are sponsored by Bam Nuttall. And if you're very lucky, you might be able to find out a little bit more about this lovely new shiny TBM. So, next then, um, our next meeting is a BTS Young Members event, which is on the Friday the 29th of April, and this is joint with TAIYM. Um, it's a unique experience, tunnelling in the Himalayas above 5,000 metres altitude. And this is online at about 1 o'clock, so look out for the details on that one. We've also got the BTS Young Members have got a couple of upcoming webinar webinars between April and May. Um, joint webinars with the Australian Telling Society Young Members, and also a webinar on discrete event simulation model for predicting tunnel boring machine utilisation. So please keep an eye out on the BTSYM social media pages for further details. Then our next meeting is on Thursday the 19th of May, and this is the BTS AGM and evening meeting. And the lecture will be given by Vancey Construction Grand Projet, um, and the title is TBC. A little bit shy at the moment. Um, and this will be in person here. So the next one then is the BTSYM conference is back. And this is on the 20th of May. And the bookings for this are now open. Um, and I think we are done with, have you got all applicants are in, in terms of presenting at the conference. Um, but I think it would turn out to be a, a great event. So please um, come along to it. So the next one then is the bookings are open for the BTS Design and Construction course 2022. And this is being run again at Warwick University from the 4th to the 8th of July. And I would recommend for anybody that hasn't yet done this course, um, please sign up. It's a great five days. And also it's a great way to get to meet other people in the industry. So a little bit of a BTS 50th anniversary book update. Um, for those of you that are here regularly, you'll know that we've been tracking the progress of this. Um, so next slide. 
So we're now down to very few um, outstanding contributions for the book. So if you have been asked for a piece, please complete it as soon as you can. Um, and if you get any more kind of requests for specific things, um, please do what you can to help out. Um, current progress is we are still seeking photographs um, that are missing or of poor quality. So if you've got any time to go through your archives and dig through them, um, please do. Um, and then really for that final drive to publication, which is hopefully really soon, um, we are still looking for additional volunteers. So if you do have any free time or just fancy doing something different with your time, um, we are looking for help kind of in terms of with um, administration, also with photo assistance. Um, also, obviously, really key and important to us is actually looking through the archive material. Um, we have a lot of information here at the IC that cannot be removed, so we've got to scan it to be able to take it away. Um, and also researchers, just to be able to really trace the membership of the committee. We've got a long time going back through 50 years. Um, so if you really do fancy something different, um, please get in touch. Next slide. And that's it in terms of announcements for me tonight. And obviously, for those of you that um, are quite tech savvy, these are all the different ways that you can get hold of us. Um, and feel free to use the, the QR code to get more information about the BTS. So that's it from me tonight. Just really, once again, congratulations. And thank you very much um, for all your time. Thank you.